I'm Matthew Cobb, I'm Professor of Zoology at the University of Manchester, and I'm going to be answering some questions. First one is, if the meteor hadn't wiped out the dinosaurs, would they have still been here today, or would they have evolved into something else? Well, uh, the answer to all the best questions in science is we don't know, and especially something like this, which is very much a what-if question. But we can have a, a guess at the kind of outline. So the first point is the question says, talks about the meteor that came and hit the Earth 65 or so million years ago. And that indeed appear, did appear to wipe out most of the non-avian dinosaurs. So the dinosaurs that we now call birds, they survived uh, okay. The rest of the dinosaurs uh, went extinct along with lots and lots of other things. But there were other things happening on the Earth at the same time. There were lots of volcanic explosions taking place and that was contributing to ch climate change as well. So the key issue is, would there have been a mass extinction uh, of the kind that we saw 65 million years ago taking place between uh, that time and now. Because if there wasn't, then you would expect things pretty much to stay as they were and the dinosaurs would have changed, there would still have been mammals, we'd been around for 250 or so million years anyway. Uh, but I think it's basically we would still be living in a dinosaur world. That having been said, it's possible that the dinosaurs, the non-avian dinosaurs, were already being weakened by the climate change induced by these uh, volcanic eruptions, in which case maybe they would have declined. Uh, I think what we can be fairly confident of is that there would not be uh, kind of feathered humanoid dinosaurs wandering around uh, strutting their stuff and in control of the planet. That would not have happened. Our existence is extremely contingent. It's a series of chance events and I don't think there's any evidence that that would inevitably have happened. Next question is, why do we not have as good a smell as, say, a dog? And what creature has the best sense of smell? Well, in fact, our sense of smell is a lot better than we think. And uh, I, do, I, I do public engagement experiments in which I show people that they can detect the difference between two smells that differ by just one atom of carbon. So in fact, you've got an atomic nose. You can tell the difference between two molecules, one of which has got seven carbons in it and the other's got eight. The difference is very subtle, but people can tell that difference. So you do have a very good sense of smell. However, the sensitivity, the level at which we can detect smells, is indeed much lower than that of, say, a dog. Part of the problem in answering this question is we really do not know how many smells any animal can smell. Uh, until a couple of years ago, people argued that humans could smell about 20,000 smells, different odour molecules, at best. And then, but nobody really actually tested this, it was a number that floated around in the literature. And then uh, at the beginning of last year, some colleagues in America did a series of experiments and some complicated maths, and they came up with the figure of well over a trillion odors that a human being can discriminate. Now this has been challenged a bit and some mathsy people have said it's not right, uh, but they know a lot about maths and not much about uh, biology. And I think most people who work in the smell field feel relatively comfortable with there being basically no limit on the number of odours uh, that we can detect. And the reason for that is we don't actually understand how the sense of smell works. The only uh, estimate we can have on differences between different animals is the number of genes they have coding for their olfactory receptors. And these are a bit like a lock that sit on the cells in your nose and in ways we don't understand they can detect odours and each odour can activate more than one of these receptors and each receptor can detect more than one kind of odour. So you get an idea that really is very, very complicated. But if we simply look at the number of olfactory receptors that each species has, and quite a lot of genomes have been sequenced now, uh, we get around about uh, 200 uh, for a bee, uh, around about 80 for a fly, around about 400 for a human being, uh, 600, I think the number is, for a dog. And then, as far as we know, the champions of olfaction are rodents, so rats and mice. And this is probably because they're using a lot of what are called pheromones, which are chemical signals used by individual animals to communicate with each other as part of their social organisation. Next question. How have humans evolved to become separate races? 
Will this change in the future? Right, the first point is the very use of the term race is much more a social construct than it is a biological one. Because although there are clearly biological differences between people that live in different parts of the world, so we have different skin colours, we have different hair, we may tend to have slightly different morphology, different facial features, these are relatively minor compared to the underlying genetic variation, which is generally much greater within a race, a biological race, than it is uh, between them. So as a biologist, I'm not completely comfortable with using the term race. Uh, and as I say, it's much more of a social construct than it is a, a, a biological one. But if we just concentrate on those extremely surface adaptations, different skin color, uh, different eye color and hair and so on, then the key explanation for that is our distribution across the globe. So if we imagine that uh, the human species evolved around about 100,000 years ago, then as it spread across the planet and we left Africa perhaps in two waves, uh, 80,000, 60,000 years ago, as we moved across the planet, which we did by walking, sailing, floating, uh, then we encountered different environments. And in those different environments, different warmth, cold, then having different skin colors and different uh, facial features and probably simply as a byproduct of that different hair had an advantage. So for example, I'm a white person and having white skin is an advantage in northern climates because we get less sun and we need sun to synthesize vitamin D. So as our ancestors moved north, the lighter skinned people were at an advantage because they were able to uh, get vitamin D from the sun. And we know that uh, people with darker skins who live in northern climates can suffer from vitamin D deficiency because they're not able to absorb as much sunlight because we don't get very much in the northern uh, hemisphere, in northern climates, northern latitudes. So will this change in the future? Well, I think it depends on uh, the degree of mixing that goes on between uh, the different races, uh, people with different color skins, different facial features and so on. And that's going to be a matter of time. Uh, at the moment, obviously, most people do not live in heavily mixed areas. Most people live in, uh, and it's the same in the UK as well, that uh, an awful lot of people in the UK live in places that are dominated by white people. Although the main urban centres have very mixed uh, ethnic uh, groupings, people tend at the moment still to be fairly isolated. So I think uh, are the races going to kind of blur? That would require quite a large amount of time and an awful lot of mixing throughout the planet. Next question is, what are the best examples of evolution in action today? I think the best example is also the most worrying one, uh, which is uh, the existence or the development of antibiotic resistance uh, in bacteria that are harmful to human beings. And the reason why we are getting the development of bacteria that are res can resist antibiotics is because we've been given out the antibiotics. Most of the bacteria are killed by them. It's very successful, so we get over whatever particular disease we have. But some of the bacteria survive because by random natural selection, they, by random variation, they had, were able to resist it. And they are now growing and are causing an increasing number of problems. And this is one of the major issues that is facing medicine and pharmaceutical industry and scientists is to develop new antibiotics that will be able to uh, hit these resistant strains which are evolving. That's how they've, it's all that evolution is. It's a change in type over time in a population. These, natu these populations are evolving uh, resistance to the antibiotics we've developed. So one of the major developments in medicine, one of the things that changed the face of the 20th century, enabling millions of people to survive, is now under threat because of evolution. Uh, and the next question is another, it's kind of mixing up smell and evolution. Is it true that human noses are still evolving in physical shape and our ability to smell? Uh, I think the short answer is no or rather I know of no evidence in either of those points. So the problem, the, the physical shape, we don't know why uh, peoples on different parts of the earth have different shaped noses. So uh, I've got quite a big hooter. Um, people who live in Africa of African origin have probably got a flatter nose. Uh, it may be that having a 
kind of big pointy nose was an advantage to the peoples who moved up into uh, the northern latitudes, although I don't know why that might be. I suspect it's simply a consequence of some other variation. Um, so the physical shape I don't know is relevant and I don't know of any evidence that it actually has a sh an effect on our ability to smell. Uh, because when you're doing the smelling, it's not with your nostrils or even with this bit, it's up here. Your nose bit is, is the cells are actually the level of your eye. It's the very, very top of your uh, nasal cavity that you're actually doing the smelling. In terms of our genes, um, uh, it's very difficult to tell. I've recently been involved in a study looking at exactly this. We looked at variation for one particular olfactory receptor gene in indigenous peoples all over the planet, and also looking at our extinct relatives, Neanderthals and Denisovans, but this is just one of our 400 genes. And I don't think we found any evidence that we're evolving anymore. Uh, we found differences between different populations, which we could interpret uh, in terms of uh, their evolutionary history. But I, I don't think we've got the evidence. We need more evidence in time to see changes in variant changes in the frequency of the different uh, genes. The next question is about smell and memory, and it's. Is there some link between why elephants never forget and how smell is the most evocative sense regarding memories? Do elephants have a keen sense of smell? Well, I'm not an elephant expert and I don't know of any studies on the sense of smell in elephants. Um, we've sequenced the elephant genome, so people have looked at their olfactory receptors, but I don't have the answer on the top of my head. However, Google is just a mere click away, so I could find the answer to it. I think more interestingly is the starting point of this question, which is, the, is it the elephants never forget? I don't know that that's true. Um, there's, you can see on TV lots of very evocative things of elephants, you know, picking up bits of bone from apparently members of their uh, group and looking very what looks to us sad. I, uh, I'm not at all sure that that's actually what's going on. Uh, elephants do have a very good memory, clearly. They're very large mammals that live in social groups, which you need to be able to remember who's who. Uh, and also they roam, so therefore they need to be able to remember where they found food or water um, in the past. Is there any link between that and, their, and the fact that olfaction can bring back memories? I, I, I don't think so. One of the problems or the fascinating things about olfaction, sense of smell, is that it enables us to recall things. Uh, and this is well known uh, if, as the Proust effect. Proust, the uh, early 20th century French writer, uh, begins his great work, uh, Remembrance of Things Past, à la recherche du temps perdu in French, uh, in which he he gets a madeleine, one of these cakey uh, things, and he dips it into the tea, and he can smell and taste it, and this takes him back to when he was a child. And we've all had that experience. You probably, I don't know, the smell of some perfume will remind you of what your nan smells like, or, you know, eating some sweet will take you back to being eight. And olfaction can release memories, very powerful memories, almost as though you're back in time. It's called redintegrative memory by psychologists. And how exactly that works, we don't know. But in all animals, what happens is that as soon as you identify, a, you detect a, a smell, your brain does two things with it. And this is true in a maggot, and it's true in you, and in an elephant, is that one, you try and identify what that smell is, and you process it and decide what you're gonna do with it, but another part of your brain starts to put that smell, that sensation into memory, and you can associate it with whatever else you're experiencing. So it's an extremely important sense for being able to, enabling the animal to dis remember what's going on. Whether elephants use their smell more than, sense of smell more than other animals in uh, remembering stuff, I have no idea. You can find that out. The next question, what do you think about the idea that plants can feel pain? I could make it easy for myself and say that uh, if you ask a neuroscientist, pain is something we, uh, that our brain creates. So uh, as the saying goes, no brain, no pain. Plants don't have a brain. They've got no central nervous system. They've got no uh, processing power anywhere that's like a brain. And so they cannot feel pain. You could also argue that in terms of evolution, we feel pain to make us react very quickly to danger, to difficult situations that we want to run away from, 
and it makes us react very quickly. So take that hand off a hot plate, run away from danger and so on. And plants can't do that because they're rooted in place. And so you could argue it doesn't make sense for plants to feel pain in the way that we do. Having said all that, plants do react to the sorts of things that give us pain. 